Hello everyone! In this video, we will put into practice the rules about EREPs which we learned about in a previous video. We will reconstruct the entire character table knowing only the operations and the number of classes in the group. The groups that we will practice on are C2V, C3V and D4. If you like, you can fill in the tables by yourself first and then check the answers with me. As a side note, please remember that we can figure out the number of classes by doing similarity transformations, but we are not going to do this now because this video would get rather lengthy. Before we do the examples, let's quickly summarize what we've learned the last time. I divided it into three segments. The first is about characteristics of vectors that make EREPs. They are mutually orthogonal. This characteristic holds no matter if we talk about individual vectors in a group or vectors whose components are characters. The vectors which have as many components as there are classes in the group also behave in the same way. Only remember to include GP in a formula. GP is the number of operations in the PIF class. The second characteristic is that the vectors that make EREPs are also normalized. What it means is that they have a uniform length. Please recall that the dot product is equal to the square of length. So what we are saying is that when we take a dot product of each of these vectors with themselves, it will give us some constant value. Vectors whose components are characters are normalized to square root of h, and the individual vectors in the EREPs are normalized to the square root of h over Li, Li being the dimension of an EREP. To be honest, we are not going to refer to individual vectors that much because we want to use the character tables, instead of constructing the matrices every time, but I just included them for the sake of a bigger picture. The second important thing is that the characters of all matrices belonging to operations in the same class are identical, obviously for a given EREP. That property allows us to write a character table in a much compact way. These three tables are for some group G, and you can see that we can go down from 10 to just 4 columns. The third thing that we learned is about the number of EREPs. We said that there are as many operations as there are individual vectors. In our particular case, the group G has 10 elements, therefore it has 10 vectors. If we focus on characters and we collect them into classes, the resulting table, the character table, is squared, because the number of classes equals the number of EREPs. The way to remember it is that everything that we are dealing with in this course is square, starting from the matrices that describe the individual operations, ending with the character table itself. And if you want more formal summary, here are all the formulas that we talked about the last time. These two are the ones that really matter to us. Rule number one, the sum of squares of the dimensions of EREPs is equal to the order of the group, H, which comes from the fact that there is as many individual vectors as there are symmetry operations in a group. And the rule number five, which tells us that the vectors in the character tables have uniform length, the square root of H, and they are orthogonal. We also said that there cannot be more than K, K-dimensional vectors that are mutually orthogonal. And we did not prove it, but we said that in fact there are K of these vectors in each group, that is the number of classes equals to the number of EREPs. Our first example is C2V. C2V group has four elements, each one in a separate class. So the rule 5 tells us that the number of EREPs of a group is equal to the number of classes in the group. So we have four EREPs. What do we know about these EREPs? Well, the rule 1 tells us that the sum of squares of the dimensions of these EREPs equals h. Also, we know that each of the dimensions must be a positive integer. So the only solution to this equation is when all the dimensions are 1. This also tells us that the entries under E operation are one as well. Now let's figure out the individual EREPs. The first EREP is easy because it's the fully symmetric EREP that I told you about in a video on Mollikin symbols. We can double check if this vector indeed is one of our EREPs by taking a dot product of this vector with itself. It does give 4 as expected. I apologize for notation, I denoted tau1 as just 1 in this formula because when I write it like this, then this tau does not look like subscript, even though it should. Also, please notice that I use this formula that sums over R, not this one which sums over classes, because in C2V group, each class has only a single element in it, so I just went for the simple formula. So let's carry on with filling in our character table. We have only one dimensional representations, so each entry will only be 1 or minus 1. To get an orthogonal vector to our first vector, tau1, the other vectors have to have two negative entries. We only have 3 by 3 section to complete, so let's put two negative numbers in each row. There is only one way of doing it, because no two EREPs can be identical. And you may say, no, there is more ways to put the minus ones. Yes, but that would only correspond to swapping the EREPs around. So, now in principle we would need to check if our vectors are mutually orthogonal, um, and you can do it or you can believe me when I say that they are. 
Our next example is C3D. We have three classes again, so that means there are three EREPs. The sum of squares of the dimensions of the EREPs must equal to the number of operations in a group, which is 6. We remember that else have to be positive integers, therefore the only solution is 1, 1, 2. That is, we have two one-dimensional EREPs and one two-dimensional EREP. So let's tackle the individual EREPs. The first one is the fully symmetric EREP. We can check if that's correct by taking the dot product of this vector with itself and its 6 as expected. Now let's focus on tau2. Because it's a one-dimensional EREP, the entries in the table of this EREP are either 1 or minus 1. We know that tau2 has to be orthogonal to tau1. Therefore, tau2 has to have minus 1 under 3 operations. We have plus 1 under E, so the only way to give tau2 3 negative entries is to put minus 1 under the reflections. So let's crack tau3. We miss 2 entries. But we can figure them out by setting two equations. We know that the dot product of the vector 1 with 3 is 0, and the vector 2 with 3 is also 0. That means tau3 has minus 1 under rotations and 0 under reflections. And if we take a dot product of tau3 with itself, it does give 6, so all good. The last step is to double check the orthogonality and the length of the vectors, and we are done. Let's do the last example, D4. D4 has 5 classes, therefore it has 5 EREPs. The sum of squares of the dimensions of these EREPs equals to the number of operations, that is 8 in this case. The only set of numbers that satisfies this equation is 1, 1, 1, 1 and 2. Now we can fill in the entries under E operation. The next step is to find out the individual EREPs. Again, the first EREP is the fully symmetric EREP. Then let's tackle the three one-dimensional EREPs. They have to be orthogonal to tau1, therefore they have to have minus 1 under 4 operations. Please notice that I don't say minus 1 under 4 classes, I said minus 1 under 4 operations. We know that they all have plus 1 under E operation, so the only way to get an even number of positive entries is to put plus 1 under C2Z. Then, it's a bit like in the previous example, we have three columns and three EREPs to work on, we put two minus one in each row, and we are done. Now is the time for tau5. There are four entries missing. We can either set up four equations by taking advantage of the fact that all the vectors need to be mutually orthogonal, or we can construct the matrices for this EREP using, for instance, x and y vectors. I'm not going to solve the linear equations, even though solving is fast in this case, simply adding the equations immediately gives minus 2 under c to z, and then we only need to deal with three equations. You can choose this method if you like, but I am going to create matrices by taking x and y vectors and performing symmetry operations on them. So, these are the matrices and we sum the diagonal terms and write them in the table. Please notice that we only need to do a single operation for each class. Also, please recall that z-axis coincides with the principal axis, so in our case, z-axis is sticking out of the page. Now we should only do the final check and we've finished. The last comment that I have is that this method requires a bit of insight because you might ask, why do I know that this two-dimensional representation is describing X and Y? Well, there are a couple of things to notice. First, in every group, there are always some irreducible representations which describe entities with x, y, and z directionality. Secondly, when we take x, y, and z vectors as basis for operations, we can immediately see if the resulting 3 by 3 matrices are in the block diagonal form or not. Just to remind you, block diagonal matrix is a square diagonal matrix in which the diagonal elements are square matrices of any size and the off diagonal elements are zeros. Let's recall the matrices that we derived for C3D group a couple of videos ago. We said that these matrices are in the block diagonal form. In this particular case, they are made by 2x2 two two and 1x1 one one blocks, and therefore they describe two-dimensional representation E and one-dimensional representation, which happens to be A1 for C3D group. And we have exactly the same situation in D4 group. These matrices that we see are 2x2, two two, but we can expand them and include the z-vector. Again, the 3x3 three three matrices break into 2x2 two two block and 1x1 one one block, and we can see that the z-vector is described by tau2, and x and y-vectors are under one two-dimensional representation.
In the next video, we will see that if we take some other set of three vectors, we would not be able to determine, just by inspection, to what EREPs the resulting 3x3 matrices are breaking into. We will need to perform similarity transformations, which changes the basis back to the standard x, y and z vectors. But as I said, that is for the next video. Please notice that the explanation using block diagonal matrices is the most elegant, but we could also say that the reason why the z vector is described by one-dimensional EREP is that the z vector always transforms into itself plus one or into the negative of itself minus one as a result of symmetry operations present in D4 group. On the other hand, x and y vectors interconvert into each other at least under some of the symmetry operations present in the group, and that's why they're described by two-dimensional EREP. The very last thing that I want to point out is that we could give these EREPs names according to the rules from the last video. The first four entries will be A's or B's, and the last will be E. A's are symmetric under C4, B's are anti-symmetric under C4, then we need to distinguish between the two A's and the two B's, so we look under C2 prime, plus one gets subscript one, and minus one gets subscript two. So that's all I have for you today, I hope it helps, thank you for watching, bye!